Hey there, it is Saturday, so it's movie night, and I'm here to present another quarantine quadruple feature for your viewing pleasure. My name is Paul, and this is my video for week 39. Now, I just recorded this entire video. I sat here narrating by myself in my living room in front of my movie collection for probably about 45 minutes, and then I uh, turned around and looked at the camera and saw that it had only filmed me for about five minutes. So now I get to do it all again, which I'm very thrilled at, but maybe it will keep me a little more succinct this time in uh, gathering up some of my thoughts. So today's topic is one that I've wanted to do for a number of months now, but I wanted to put some time between actually delivering this video and the events that inspired this video. I came up with this quadruple feature way back during the height of the Black Lives Matter protests, protesting the murder of innocent unarmed black people at the hands of overly aggressive police officers. I didn't want to discuss these films too critically, so I wanted to put a little time in between those events. However, I decided this week that I was finally going to do this topic, and then, sure enough, uh, another unarmed black person is killed at the hands of a police officer. Casey Goodson Jr., 23 years old, was killed in his own home by an off-duty police officer in front of two toddlers and his grandmother. The cop said he mistook the fucking sandwich he was holding for a gun. So... Apparently, there's never going to be a good time to do a topic like this, so we'll just do our best to kind of address the subject matter of these films in a respectful way that can hopefully add some discourse to the national conversation that's going on about police brutality right now. So today we're looking at loose cannon movies, sometimes referred to as cowboy cops. And as someone who grew up in the 80s, a child of the 80s, that watched a lot of films in my household. I was fed a steady diet of films from the Lethal Weapon series, Die Hard, and the Dirty Harry movies. Those were on regular rotation in my house. And I think that's the case for a lot of Americans who, who grew up on these films. And you watch these movies and you're sort of taught that it's okay for a cop to go above the law once in a while to get someone who's really bad. So if they have to rough up a suspect to get the information, that's all for the greater good. If they have to plant drugs on a known drug dealer to get the case to stick, that's all for the greater good. We're sort of taught that through our entire lives through these films. So I do think at his, it has sort of created a culture where we're on the side of the cop because we always see them as the good guy, even when they're going beyond the law. A loose cannon is a cop that's unpredictable. You can't really put a leash on them. They're always getting yelled at by the chief, causing property damage. They're rough on the on their suspects. They beat them up. They're overly aggressive. And in these movies, it's always sort of portrayed as men that are getting the job done. And again, I don't want to look at these movies hypercritically, even though they have helped foster a generation of people that, you know, worship police officers and, and think that they should be above the law and can do whatever they want. These movies are sort of responsible for that. But we're also adults that can identify and recognize the problematic parts of entertainment, separate it from our own lives, and still enjoy it for what it is. Hopefully, hopefully most of us can do that. Of course, some people can't, but I do just want to talk about these types of films because I think they're interesting and I think for the most part, they're pretty fucking entertaining as well. So we're going to talk about some of these cop movies, these cowboy cop movies, which I like to call loose cannons. So that's our topic for today. So for, for this quadruple feature, I'm wearing my cop jacket, which is actually not a cop jacket. This is my grandma's old motorcycle jacket that I got handed down to me. And then my dare shirt, which is you know, I, I looked around to try to dress the part, but it's the only thing I have even remotely close to any cop apparel. So, so that's my cop outfit. So the first one we're going to talk about is the first sort of loose cannon cop movie that I can think of. The one that really kicked off the genre, especially in Japan, but would later go on to really influence a lot of American films as well. Akira Kurosawa's Stray Dog, which unfortunately I don't have a case for, but this is the first one from 1949 that I can think of. And this movie basically invented 
all of the tropes of the loose cannon renegade cop movies that you can think of. You know that scene in Magnolia where John C. Riley is a police officer and he loses his gun and he stresses about it? That's what this entire movie is. It's about a rookie cop who loses his gun. It gets, it gets lifted from him on a train ride and then he spends the rest of the film trying to track down where that gun has gone. Crimes start being reported back involving his bullets and the crimes start getting more and more severe. So the first one is like a robbery and they dug the bullet out of someone's elbow, but the second one is actually a murder. And he thinks that they're gonna get worse and worse. And he starts taking on all the guilt of these crimes because they're happening with his gun. So as he tries more and more frantically to track down his gun, he becomes more and more erratic and starts stepping a little bit outside the law in order to track down where his gun has gone. And watching it, having had a steady diet of loose cannon cop movies through my entire childhood, it's really fascinating to kind of see where so many of these ideas started from and how early they started. Uh, there's also a lot of really beautiful framing. I mean, it's Kurosawa, one of the great filmmakers of all time. Stray Dog is also where you see Kurosawa kind of coming into his own as a filmmaker and the visual style of Kurosawa that we know him for today. This movie is really kind of where you see him turning from filmmaker to like exceptional filmmaker who's owning the medium. He wanted to make a film like the Japanese pulp novels about detective stories that were very big in Japan through the 40s. He didn't know how to make one, so he wrote his own pulp novel, Stray Dog, and then he turned it into a screenplay. Stray Dog has a, a finale that is really beautiful. Some of the shot compositions are really exciting and just a just a fantastic ending. It's very layered and complex. What the title Stray Dog means, I think, is there are all kinds of people sort of on the outskirts of society, maybe are poor or prostitutes or homeless or whatever. There's all of these people kind of surrounding society that they view as stray dogs. And any of them could have the potential to become a rabid dog. If they turn to a life of crime, if they start robbing people, if they start killing people, then they're gonna view them as more of like a rabid dog as opposed to a stray dog. So one of these stray dogs happened to get his gun, which could very well open a door to a life of crime and turn that person into a rabid dog. So that's sort of, I think, what the title means. So we're gonna jump ahead a few decades to the late 60s, 68, I believe, for an important cop movie, I suppose, for what it did for the genre hasn't necessarily held up as well over time. It's still got some pretty exciting sequences, but Bullet starring blue-eyed god Steve McQueen, mainly notable for a very famous car chase scene, which is quite exciting at the time. This one's not really a loose cannon movie. He's just kind of a dipshit cop. In 1971 is actually where we have uh, our, our loose cannon genre really kicking off, and it kicks off big with Dirty Harry, probably the most important loose cannon cop film that's ever been made. The 70s found us in a counterculture wave where we started identifying characters as anti-heroes. They're people that aren't doing things by the rules, they're doing things their own way, but we root for them as an audience. And Dirty Harry was really one of the first big successful anti-heroes. You saw it in the late 60s, 68 and 69 with Easy Rider, and Bonnie and Clyde. And those two movies really sort of blew up Hollywood and how we made movies and how we identified our heroes. So Dirty Harry took that ball and ran with it for five movies. It turned into a, a whole series of films and they're actually all pretty solid, but Dirty Harry is the most influential of all of them. It of course stars Clint Eastwood and it's sort of a riff on the Zodiac Killer. So it's not the Zodiac Killer, he's called like the Scorpio Killer and he's sending letters to, you know, police officers and news stations and they're encoded and Dirty Harry is trying to solve this crime. And he doesn't care who he hurts in the process and he shoots suspects in the leg or whatever, right? He doesn't do things by the book and he gets yelled at by his lieutenant and he destroys public property and all of these things that we've come to know and love for the loose cannon genre. All of that you find in Dirty Harry. It's just kind of like a balls out fun cop movie. 
and inspired a whole series of films. 1971 also gives us another cop movie that is equally important. I'd say it's more important cinematically. It's not one of our four movies because it's not as much of a loose cannon movie. It's just a cop who's really rough around the edges and really, and really goes for it. That's Popeye Doyle in... The French Connection, William Friedkin's masterpiece, The French Connection, starring Gene Hackman and Roy Scheider as his partner. The French Connection is a really gritty, intense, in-your-face cop thriller. It's a fantastic movie, one of the best of the 70s. And it was one of the first movies to really use this sort of like documentary-style filmmaking. And the way they did that was... William Friedkin hired a documentary filmmaker, a filmmaker that had been following Castro around Cuba and documenting him. And so as a documentary filmmaker, you know, you're always kind of filming and people will get in the way and you have to re-find the shot. So you have to find your subject, you have to get them in focus, and you're kind of always constantly moving when you're following a subject who's on the move and talking to a lot of people. And William Friedkin watched a lot of this footage of Castro, and he said, I want footage like that for my crime thriller. So he hired that guy as his cameraman. And the way they would film is William Friedkin and the actors would go in and they would, <clears throat> they would light the scenes, they would block the scenes, they would rehearse. Everyone knew what was happening in the scene, but the camera operators didn't. So then he would send them in the room and say, we're gonna run the scene now, roll, find the shot. So they would start rolling and, and you know, he would be filming and then an actor would move over there and get in the way and then he would have to, and he would have to move and readjust the camera to kind of always be finding the shot. So it always has a feel like you're in the room and someone steps in your way and you, and you look past them and it has a very in your face natural feel to the filmmaking, which you hadn't really seen a ton before the French connection, but you know, Freakin is a genius. He won Best Director for this film. It also won Best Picture. That anecdote, by the way, as well as tons of other amazing pieces of information, I found in the new documentary, I, I believe called Leap of Faith on Shudder. And it's basically just William Friedkin talking about The Exorcist for an hour and a half. It's just a really long interview, but he talks about other films in his filmography as well, and it's very fascinating. I've seen a number of documentaries about the making of The Exorcist, and I think Leap of Faith was better and more informative than all of them, and it's just Friedkin talking, who has an amazing memory for all of his productions. He has amazing anecdotes, and he has really wonderful insights on the meanings of his films. So I highly recommend checking that one out as well. So French Connection, brilliant cop movie. It's not one of our four today, just because it's not as much of a loose canon film, but it was definitely important to the cop genre. The 70s also gave us uh, Death Wish starring Charles Bronson. Death Wish spawned a series of sequels as well. Death Wish is not um, a renegade cop movie. This is a vigilante movie. Charles Bronson does not play a cop in any way, shape, or form. I think he's an architect, and his wife is, like, raped and murdered, and then he's living in this crime-infested city, and then he just gets some guns, and he goes taking care of the crime. So it's one of those you know, cheer for the vigilante type movies that was definitely inspired by loose cannon renegade cop type films. But Death Wish is sort of its own thing that kicked off a whole slew of imitators of vigilante movies. So we're not really going to talk about those, but I did want to address Death Wish and kind of what it did for a different sort of cop subgenre. And the 80s are, are very interesting. We get movies that are, I guess you would call them more fun. While Dirty Harry and The French Connection are very exciting movies, they aren't hilarious. They don't really have much of a sense of humor about them. But then you start getting movies like Beverly Hills Cop, which is more of a comedy than an action movie. Now, I don't, I'm not in love with Beverly Hills Cop. I enjoy it. I think it's all right as a comedy. I think it's all right as an action movie. I don't think it's great as either, but people really love Beverly Hills Cop. Eddie Murphy, of course, gives like a nice dynamic performance and he's, he's pretty funny in it. But Beverly Hills Cop is important because I think that's the first time they, they coined the term cowboy cop. I think it came from Beverly Hills Cop, which that ball was then picked up and ran with for Die Hard. Um, I'm not really going to qualify that one as a loose cannon movie. That one is, yeah, I guess he's a cowboy cop and he's doing what he can in the moment. But usually these renegade cop loose cannon movies, you usually see 
a period of time where the cop gets more and more reckless and aggressive as he gets closer and closer to solving this crime. This all takes place over the course of one night where it's all kind of wrapped up tightly at, at this at this Christmas party. So, okay, now we're going to get to movie number three, maybe one of the most important of the loose cannon films, certainly the most important of the buddy cop movies, which we're going to talk about on another week. Lethal Weapon, starring Mel Gibson and Danny Glover. This is a movie that really hinges on the relationship between the two lead characters. In fact, that's what spawned the entire series. There's three sequels, there's four Lethal Weapon films, and it basically just rides on their relationship with each other because they have such good chemistry together. Now, the first movie is more centered on kind of Mel Gibson being a loose cannon, being erratic and unpredictable and scary and dangerous and putting people in danger to get the results that he wants. And he doesn't give a fuck because he's, he's borderline suicidal. But he gets less and less erratic as the movies go on. I mean, he's still like a loose cannon through the whole series. But in the course of the entire quadrilogy, he, you know, meets someone, he starts a relationship, he has connections that he didn't have before. So I guess he becomes kind of more of a real human throughout the course of the course of the four films. But I think this one is, is a really fun action spectacle. It was written by Shane Black. And this movie became every aspiring screenwriter's goal to write your movie and then sell it for a ton of money and then become the, you know, the sensation around town, the, the hip new screenwriter. He sold it for more than any screenplay, more than any spec screenplay had ever been sold at that point. I think it was like a quarter of a million dollars. And then he became the go-to writer and script puncher-upper for, for a number of years. And the crazy thing about Lethal Weapon is they pack in so many classic scenes, so many tropes of the genre, and whether it's, you know, the good guy held up being be, being tortured while tied up, or the, the hostage exchange, or family member getting kidnapped, the come to Jesus moment of like, no more fucking around, we have to get serious, there's gonna be blood, you know? The, the, those types of sequences are all in Lethal Weapon. What's crazy is they're all packed into the same movie, so it's almost just like, High energy action, set piece, or a quick little funny scene, action, set piece, action, set piece, and they cram them in that, like, you'd think this is, everything that happens in the movie would actually happen over the span of, like, three movies or so, but um, everywhere they go, there happens to be, like, a crazy shootout, and it's totally unbelievable, but it, it's a lot of fun. You can't really deny that. Lethal Weapon and all of the all of the spinoffs are are a lot of fun, I think. The late 80s is where you start to see the cop movies veer from anti-heroes to borderline villains. Now, I'd still qualify the cops in John Woo's films from Hong Kong, The Killer and Hard Boiled. I would still say they're they're like good cops, but they are definitely reckless with the shootouts they get in. The amount of bystanders that must be killed in these movies is astronomical, and you certainly wouldn't see cops acting like that in, in real life. No, I, you do see cops acting like that in real life. Um, however, this is uh, you know, John Woo's action Hong Kong films are where you would start to see them have even more of a disregard for human life. And then a Japanese film called Violent Cop, you see that as well. A cop that just walks around bitch slapping everyone he encounters. But that one's actually a lot of fun. And then in the 80s, we also get uh, another film kind of pushing the boundaries of how far cops are willing to go and how far we're willing to follow them as a main character, even when they're particularly bad people. And our fourth movie that we're gonna watch today is Michael Cimino's Year of the Dragon. Year of the Dragon follows Mickey Rourke as a police officer in Chinatown trying to clean up a violent, drug-infested Chinatown. He's a Vietnam War veteran and he is racist against Asians. It doesn't matter if they're you know, Vietnamese, Chinese, Korean, he does not care. He hates all Asians. So this movie really starts you off in a tough spot of now having to sit for two hours and 15 minutes with a very unpleasant character. He's also sexist. His marriage is crumbling. He can't give it the amount of time that he needs to save it. He's in the process of falling in love with someone else. And that relationship is toxic as well. So he's a real asshole through the whole movie. And it goes from anti-hero to like, straight up deplorable person that you're watching be a cop. What Michael Cimino does really brilliantly in his films, and really this is the reason why I wanted this one as our fourth movie, is 
He has very long exposition scenes punctuated with surprising outbursts of shocking violence, which is very much the trademark of filmmakers like Quentin Tarantino. Okay, so you see like a 15 minute dialogue scene in the in the basement of a bar in Glorious Bastards, and that scene ends with 20 seconds of explosive, shocking violence that is well choreographed and well filmed, and it's very exciting. Michael Cimino does the exact same thing. Now he's uh, really got his big break with The Deer Hunter, which was, astronomically successful film. He won Best Director. It won Best Picture. It was a hit. And it's really a phenomenal film. It's one of my favorite films. But he really takes that to the nth degree. Like, there's like an hour-long wedding sequence of just people celebrating and having a wedding that then, like, smash cuts to the Vietnam War. So the way he makes his films really puts you off guard. And I think he's really strong American filmmaker. We lost him a few years ago, but I think he does really fascinating films. And Year of the Dragon, complex though it may be, and conflicting of a main character as Mickey Rourke plays, is a really fascinating movie. And the way he stages his action pieces are explosive, exciting, crazy, and very entertaining. So that's going to be our fourth movie. There was a couple others that I was considering for the fourth option, but the reason I went with Year of the Dragon is because he's he's still a cop that's trying to follow the rules for the most part. He's a loose cannon. You, he's unpredictable, but he's not a straight-out villain. Some of these other films that I'm going to talk about now, they take the idea of loose cannon a lot further. And in the 2000s, you start to see loose cannons straight up just being villains. And in 2001, Antoine Fuqua's Training Day, starring Denzel Washington and Ethan Hawke. Denzel Washington won Best Actor at the Academy Awards. The Academy loves when a good guy takes a villain turn. Um, but this movie, I mean, he's a cop, and he, and he arrests people, but he's also a bad guy. He also murders people, and he, and he does drugs, and he steals from people. So the 2000s went from kind of, you know, the blurred line between good and bad and just kind of eradicated that line. Same with Filth with uh, James McAvoy and the movie that was almost my fourth choice because I love it so, The Bad Lieutenant, Port of Call, New Orleans, which is a film by Werner Herzog. But I didn't go with it again because I don't see him as a loose cannon. I don't see him as a renegade cop. I see him as a cop that is also a criminal. Uh, this one has a very unhinged performance by Nicolas Cage, but it's a tremendous performance. It's a wild film, but I really love it. So Abel Ferreira, a filmmaker in the 90s, made a movie called Bad Lieutenant starring Harvey Keitel, which is just about a cop who abuses the law and he's addicted to drugs and he's kind of a piece of shit. And Werner Herzog, he's one of the most unpredictable filmmakers that's working. He decided he was going to remake it, set it in New Orleans. So the cop... He does something heroic during Hurricane Katrina. He, he saves someone and he injures his back, starts taking painkillers, becomes addicted to them. And now for the rest of the movie, we have this dope fiend cop who is also getting drugs and dealing with, with shady characters. So he's, he's like more of a criminal than like a cowboy cop or a, or a loose cannon, which is the only reason this is not our fourth movie that we're watching tonight. Um, but, I, but I really love Bad Lieutenant and I would strongly recommend checking that out. Werner Herzog is one of our most unpredictable and exciting filmmakers that we have. One of the more recent films that we got in theaters in 2020 before everything shut down was Bad Boys for Life, which is of course the third movie in the Bad Boys trilogy. The first two were directed by Michael Bay and they're big dumb action set pieces, but they're very much the epitome of a loose cannon movie. These two cops that, you know, play by their own rules and the captain is always yelling at them and things happen that like put people in danger and they're and they're fun but they're very stupid bad boys for life i actually thought was a really solid movie i thought it was the best of the three and i had a great time watching this the chemistry between the two of them martin lawrence and will smith was better than ever they wrote a better role for martin lawrence than they ever had which really allowed him to showcase some 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 really good acting so i actually thought bad boys for life was great if you just need another kind of fun action buddy cop type movie, then, then I would recommend that one. But the four movies that we are watching today for loose cannon cop movies, we're going to start with the first one that I can think of, Kurosawa's Stray Dog, Japanese film from 1949. Then we're going to jump up to 1971 for probably the most influential loose cannon cop movie that's ever been made, Dirty Harry, 
directed by Don Siegel, starring Clint Eastwood. And then we're going to go to uh, the one that really injected fun into this subgenre and a sense of kind of nonstop action, which is Lethal Weapon, directed by Richard Donner, starring Mel Gibson and Danny Glover. And we're going to wrap it up. Year of the Dragon. This one will make you feel a certain type of way. And I don't know what type of way it is, but it's a pretty exciting and interesting movie. So that's the one we're going to wrap it up on. So... <clears throat> Those are the four movies that we are going to be watching for our Loose Cannon Cop movies. I hope that you are taking care of yourself. I hope you're staying safe. Thanks for watching. See you next week.